This week on the show, we cover the SCP client vulnerabilities, uh, the BSDs versus Linux benchmarks on a Tyan Epic server. We have also fame for the Unix inventors in this episode, as well as Die IPv4. GhostBSD 18.12 has been released. We have also a bit of Unix in pictures and more in this week's episode of BSD Now. BSD Now, episode 281, Epic Server Battle, recorded on the 16th of January 2019. Hello, I'm your host, Benedict Reuschling. And I'm Alan Jude. Hey, we're back this week, and of course, well, back from our usual stuff, not from a conference, but we have headlines that interests not just the BSD folks, but pretty much all the Unixes, uh, since there is an SCP client multiple vulnerability out, well, well too many, oh, also, Alan, give us... Affects- <laughs> Every operating system, almost, I think. Even Windows oh, right. is affected by this one. Right, WinSCP and, and stuff. Uh, uh, WinSCP and PuTTY, in addition to OpenSSH, and probably Aye. most other ones. Uh, oh, so okay. even if you're using an older version of Windows that doesn't have OpenSSH built in, your SSH client is probably still a problem. So um, SCP clients from multiple vendors are susceptible to a malicious SCP server uh, performing unauthorized changes to the target directory or the client output manipulation. So the idea here is if you connect to an SAP server that happens to be malicious, it can make the client do bad things to your computer. Now, most times the SAP server you're going to connect to is not some random one you've never connected to before. It's probably your server and not likely to be malicious. Um, And if there's some kind of man in the middle attack, they're going to have uh, a different uh, host hash thing and you'll get the big scary warning when you try to connect. But anyway, so uh, basic description of the vulnerability. Many SCP clients fail to verify if the objects returned by the SCP server actually match those that the client requested. Uh, This issue dates back to 1983 and the RCP command which was basically remote copy. Uh, It was a not encrypted version of SCP, basically. Um, But it was all that existed back in the day, uh, was RCP. And then eventually SCP came and replaced it by making a secure version where the uh, authentication would be stronger and use keys and have encryption. And the Uh, R changed to S. Yes. Uh, a separate flaw in the client could also allow the target directory attributes to be changed arbitrarily. And finally, two additional vulnerabilities in clients may allow the server to spoof the client output. So, uh, the main impact here is that a malicious SCP server could write arbitrary files to the directory where you're trying to copy the file when using SCP. So you ask for one file and it might actually send you two or three files, uh, which obviously isn't what you intended. Uh, Change the target directory permissions and uh, spoof the client output. Uh, So looking at uh, the first vulnerability here, described in more detail, an attacker controlled server or a man in the middle if uh, they've managed to get you to accept the wrong host fingerprint. Uh, You request a file, in this example, it's uh, readme.txt, but it also transfers dot bash underscore aliases into that same directory, which in this case happens to be your home directory. Mm. Um, And then, so that's one of the vulnerabilities. And then the other one is that it uses um, ASCII or ANSI control characters to actually erase the line of output showing it copying the other file. So you tell it to copy readme.txt, it copies both files, but issues the uh, ANSI sequence to cause the second line to be written over top of the first line, so you only see the file you actually wanted being transferred, and you don't see that it actually transferred a second file. Stealthy. So it's mangling the uh, output of your client on your machine by writing special characters to standard error uh, from the remote machine. So normally, what that would look like is copy the first file, an error message from the server copied the second file. But instead of an error message, they 
uh, issue the ANSI code that causes you to move the cursor back up one line. And then, so as soon as you're done, it overwrites the, the one file name with the other. So once they've done this, you've copied the readme.txt like you expected. You've just also copied this .bash underscore aliases file. So the next time you start a shell, all the malicious commands that the bad guy wrote into uh, bash aliases get run on your machine as your user. Whoops. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> um, so there are a couple different vulnerabilities here. Uh, the first one, CWE20, is that the SCP client improperly does directory name validation. So that's uh, CVE 2018-20685. Uh, so the SCP client allows the server to modify the permissions of a target directory. So normally when you're downloading a directory, it tells you what the permissions were so that you can copy the permissions. Uh, and so it says here, you know, it's D, the permissions, like 0777. Uh, but if you, instead of specifying the directory that you want to change the permissions on, if you just leave that field blank, um, when it runs the command, it'll end up accidentally doing it to the current directory, which you're not supposed to be able to modify the permissions on. Mm. So for this one, if, say, the malicious person is also on your machine, uh, they could make your home directory world readable and writable. So they could easily, say, go and add um, their SSH key to your authorized keys file. Yeah, and you don't get in, but the other person gets in. Yeah. Huh. Uh, or you could do the same thing by specifying the directory name as a dot. So in both of these cases, the client should notice this and reject it, but it doesn't. Uh, the second vulnerability, uh, CV2019-6111, uh, due to the SCP implementation being derived from the original RCP uh, from 1983, the server chooses which files and directories are sent to the client. However, the client only performs very cursory validation of the object names that are returned. So only directory traversal attacks are prevented. So a malicious SCP server can overwrite arbitrary files in the target directory. Uh, if the recursive operation is performed, the server can manipulate subdirectories as well. For example, download and overwrite your authorized keys file with a different content. Um, the same vulnerability was found in WinSCP, but has uh, a different CVE number because it was found earlier, but they didn't realize it was the same thing till after. So that's uh -huh. CVE 2018-20684. Uh, so WinSCP is also vulnerable. Uh, and then they have SCP client spoofing via object name. Uh, so this is due to the missing character encoding in the progress display the object name can be used to manipulate the client output, for example, to employ ASCII codes to hide additional files that are being transferred. Uh, so you, by writing to standard out, or sorry, standard error, uh, the server can spoof the output. Mm -hmm. Or sorry, now this one is by mangling the name of the file, it can trick you. And then the fourth vulnerability is uh, due to accepting and displaying arbitrary standard error output from the server, a malicious server can manipulate the client's output by using ANSI codes on standard error. So two different ways to hide the file names when it's sending you more than you asked for. Mm -hmm. Understood. Uh, so they have a proof of concept of what one of these malicious SCP servers would look like, uh, and they'll release that in the future once uh, people have had a chance to patch up. So looking at the four different vulnerabilities, uh, OpenSSH's SCP client uh, is vulnerable to all four different vulnerabilities. The PuTTY uh, PSCP client for various OSs is vulnerable to the third and fourth one. So uh, the file name mangling, but not the other two. And then WinSCP is vulnerable to number two. Um, then the TECTIA, I don't know how to pronounce the name of that, obviously, European company. <laughs> um, but their SSH client, SCPG3, is not affected because it actually uses SFTP for everything. It doesn't ever actually use SCP, which is a different protocol than SFTP. 
Um, so for mitigations, um, if you're using OpenSSH, you could switch to using SFTP only uh, and deny use of SCP. Uh, alternatively, you can apply a set of patches that they have available. Uh, note that this patch uh, might cause problems if the remote and local shells don't actually agree on the way that a globbing pattern might work. So it's not necessarily the right patch, it's just a mitigation for now. Uh, PuTTY, there's no known fix available yet. And for WinSCP, if you upgrade to version 5.14 or later, then the vulnerability is fixed. Okay, so you're fine then. Yep. And remember, this is a 35-year-old thing. Yeah. Uh, in particular, they also note the similarities to previous vulnerabilities, including CVE 2000-0992, which was uh, an SCP can overwrite arbitrary files vulnerability found in the year 2000, which would be 19 years ago. Mm, that's also long. Yeah. Okay, so patch time. And uh, yeah, remember the SCP protocol or the, the channel between the two machines is still protected. There's no vulnerability for that, but the maliciousness coming from uh, these escape sequences and other things that Alan mentioned. Yep. Um, so the vulnerabilities were found by Harry Sintonin uh, of F-Secure. Uh, and there's a timeline of when they initially discovered vulnerabilities one and two and reported those to OpenSSH and got an acknowledgement. Then later when they discovered uh, vulnerabilities three and four, uh, and then how they found those for PuTTY and reported them and WinSCP and reported them. Um, and also um, since the public disclosure, they added a warning about issues that could be caused by their patch uh, with the shell globbing. Uh, and have also added, uh, uh, fixed the patch for um, Apparently, there is a problem with one byte durant names. Hmm. Okay. Well, that's what it is. And mm -hmm. hopefully, next week, everyone in the world has patched their Unix servers. Uh, luckily, it's the client that has the vulnerabilities here. Um, so it's a bit easier to mitigate because it's not going to require restarting SSHD or rebooting or anything. Although, you can restart SSHD without dropping currently open sessions, so it wouldn't have been a big deal if it required fixing the server, but it is only a client side fix, so not a big deal. Mm -hmm. Yep, okay. Another story that we have is uh, more benchmarking. Uh, we have FreeBSD 12.0 versus Dragonfly BSD 5.4 versus TrueOS 18.12 versus Linux on a Tyan Epic server uh, over at Pharonix. And they start their article with last month when running FreeBSD 12.0 benchmarks on a 2P Epic server, uh, they weren't able to run uh, any side-by-side -side benchmarks with the new Dragonfly 5.4, as this BSD was crashing during the boot process on that board. But fortunately, on another AMD Epic server available, uh, the Epic 1P tie-in transport SX. Uh, whoa, this this sounds like a. Number. Star, Star Trek serial number for Starship uh, <laughs> model number here. Uh, the Dragonfly BSD 5.4.1 runs fine. So for this first round of the BSD benchmarking in 2019, uh, the tests are for FreeBSD 11.2, 12.0, Dragonfly BSD 5.4.1, the new True S18.12, and a few Linux distributions, CentOS 7, Ubuntu 18.4.1 LTS, and Clear Linux in particular. And this EPIC 7601 server in a variety of workloads. So Dragonfly BSD 5541 uh, ran fine on this tie-on server and could boot fine, unlike the issue encountered on the Dell PowerEdge R7425 on this particular BSD. But on the tie-on server, Dragonfly BSD 522 would boot, so only the latest Dragonfly BSD release series was used as part of the comparison. So we can see uh, some of the benchmarks here. And of course, there are uh, multiple pages uh, for the different uh, benchmarks, like the compile benchmarks and the Go benchmarks. Um, the other ones comprise of the uh, Himeo and Stockfish, as well as compilation, C-Ray, Prime. So there's a couple of things for desktop-specific things or, or, let's say, development-oriented 
workloads, Node.js parts. And of course, uh, really interesting there is the compile benchmark for the actual compiling. Uh, FreeBSD was the fastest, but I guess that might actually be ZFS. Uh, just playing, yeah. letting the writes get done faster and caching better. Um, it's interesting that the initial crates were slower on FreeBSD, though. Yeah. Uh, wonder what, what I was mostly there. interested in here was looking at in most of the Linux benchmarks that they've done on Intel processors, obviously Intel Clear Linux has had an advantage. What difference does it have when it's running on AMD? And uh, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that would be less tuned towards the processor or the mm -hmm. architecture. Okay, oh, the architecture so, is about the same, but yeah. Yeah, the, if you know the, the Intel micro -architecture specifics, is yeah, then you know, ah, I need to tune this little bit here and that one, and that gives you a couple more points on the benchmark. Yeah. I'm sure there's an explanation for some of the other differences. Uh, I wish I had time at some point to just play with the Fornix test suite a bit and figure out why some of these differences are that big. Uh, and if it's just that, you know, Go is compiled slightly differently on Linux than on BSD, uh, or if there's, you know, what is the difference is causing, uh, in this case, the much higher latency on the HTTP requests, uh, because I doubt it's that FreeBSD is that much slower at anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would be interesting to see. Um, and then apparently for some reason, Dragonfly is really slow at doing JSON. And I'm sure there's an explanation for that. Yeah, and you can see that uh, typically 12, uh, FreeBSD 12 is faster than 11.2. Right, which goes back to the benchmarks we talked about the other week where uh, you know, 12 was actually a reasonable improvement over 11 in most cases. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, benchmarking is always interesting, but uh, take it with a grain of salt and run your own benchmarks. But don't trust your own benchmarks. <laughs> that, that, that too. Don't yeah, trust, trust but verify. <laughs> yeah. Because like you know say, what kind of, yeah, because you're the are, person who knows what kind of uh, right. but, benchmark you're running in the actual workload you're putting the server into, and then you know what's, what's better or uh, snazzier. Because, yeah, there are lies, damn lies, and benchmarks, but because <laughs> like, this is the problem I have with the way foreign access or benchmarks sometimes. Looking at this um, pressure solver, and they're claiming that on the same hardware, FreeBSD 11.2 did only 55 M flops, whereas FreeBSD 12 did 30, uh, 3,200. Mm, that's quite and a I'm, difference. Yeah. I'm guessing something that, that there's a better explanation for that than that, you know, uh, FreeBSD 12 is 600 and 40 times faster or something like that. <laughs> yeah, that should be evaluated a bit more into into each individual benchmark they did. But it's a good overall anyway. benchmark over a different yep. use cases you would put a server into. All right. Yes, because the other one like here, like uh, TrueOS 18.12 is basically just FreeBSD 12. It can't be really that different. But yeah. in this benchmark, uh, they're saying that compiling PHP took 124 seconds versus 85 seconds. Hmm. Yeah, they're, 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 I think there's not much tuning going into the, the desktop distribution for um, PHP. I, well, no. Like the in the benchmark, it should be compiling PHP the same way, and so. Yeah. I'm sure there's some other explanation for it, um, but you know, Foreignx doesn't seem to ever ask the question why. And as we learned from Ben and Greg about benchmarking, if you haven't asked why recursively at least five times, then you know your results aren't valid yet. <laughs> you know, get to the bottom of the the issue. Yeah, yeah. It's just it's one thing to just post the benchmark results and try to interpret them, but also mm -hmm. you know going deeper and asking on each of those systems what's the, the cause of that slowdown or why is it so good compared to the others? Because mm -hmm. like, for example, with this prime number generation test, I'm guessing what you end up actually benchmarking here is not the difference between FreeBSD 11.2 and FreeBSD 12, but the different versions of Clang that they used. Yeah, because there's also optimizations there from the compiler side. 
well, generating prime numbers basically doesn't have anything to do with the operating system. So, <laughs> yeah. 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 So, yeah, take it with a grain of salt and uh, make mm -hmm. your own. <laughs> Time for the news roundup this week with the National Inventors Hall of Fame honors the creators of Unix. Woo! Yes, uh, so at CES this year, uh, the National Inventors Hall of Fame uh, joined Engadget on stage uh, to announce the 2019 class of inductees. While the uh, official introduction ceremony won't actually happen until May 2nd uh, at the National Building Museum in DC. Um, we can tell you the 19 separate inventors representing 12 different inventions that will be honored uh, in May. Uh, the group ranges from relatively obscure creators of a programming language used by engineers and scientists to household names uh, like Black & Decker, uh, the inventors of the first portable hand drill. Uh -huh. uh, but uh, the big ones for us are obviously uh, Denny, Dennis Ritchie, uh, who is posthumously awarded, and Ken Thompson for the creation of the Unix operating system uh, and the C programming language. I say uh, the creation of the Unix operating system and the C programming languages were pivotal developments in the progress of computer science. Today, 50 years later, um, Unix and Unix-like operating systems continue to run machinery from supercomputers to smartphones. The Unix operating system remains the basis of uh, much of the world's computing infrastructure, and the C language, written to simplify the development of C across platforms, is one of the most widely used languages today. Mm -hmm. uh, they also gave out awards for web browser for the blind and visually impaired, um, visual instrumentation, lab view, uh, medical devices for low resource settings, uh, like I said, the Unix operating system, the digital protective relay uh, for a microprocessor, or it's a microprocessor-based relay switch, uh, micro well arrays, uh, the digital non-linear editing system, uh, obviously for making videos and so on, and uh, diuretics uh, and... Uh, other medical thing I can't pronounce. <laughs> like I said, Black and Decker for the uh, cordless or for the electric drill. Uh, but that's not a drill. medical thing. That one isn't. <laughs> but the the one above it, uh, the for thiazide diuretics and chlorothiazide. Uh, yeah, it's helpful. I'm sure. Uh, the first class of drugs to safely and effectively treat hypertension. So heart pills. That's oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> That's good. Yes. Um Andrew Higgins for the L C V P, uh, which I think is a hovercraft. Oh, that could be the, yeah. or, well landing craft vehicle personnel. So I guess not a hovercraft, but a beach landing craft. Uh the one used at D Day. There you go. Um Bread machines and the uh, fluoride toothpaste. Yes, quite important. Your teeth are much more healthy this way. It yeah. turns out, but uh, it's interesting to see when such fundamental things as like you know handheld power tools and uh, you know hypertension pills and um, toothpaste, Unix is considered that fundamental now. Mm. Yeah, you would think that they all these things have been around forever, and because, but someday someone has invented them, and mm -hmm. yeah, you likely give them the honors they deserve. Uh, speaking of something else, um, we have an article here about die IPv4 die, so that's <laughs> quite aggressive. You can see the hammer in the big picture at the beginning. Yes, I only know um, one person that talks like that. <laughs> yeah. So the article starts with, imagine it is 2019. Easy, huh? Imagine it is 2019 and you want to turn off IPv4. Like, off, off. Really off. Not disabling IPv6, but disabling IPv4. So two steps back here. You might be coming here wondering, 
why would anybody want to do what we are asking to be do to be doing? So it is that simple. We're running data centers like data center light with a lot of IPv6 only equipment. There simply is no need for IPv4. So why would we want to have it enabled? Also, here at the uh, Ungleich block here, um, the, they defined in 2019 as the year to move away from IPv4. So the challenge here is, do you like puzzles, competitions, challenges, hacking? Well, if any of this is uh, of your interest, here's a real challenge for you. We offer 100 uh, Swiss francs, Schweizer Franken, uh, which is roughly 100 US dollar, you know, exchange rates, um, for anyone who can give them a detailed description of how to turn IPv4 completely off in an operating system and allowing it to communicate with IPv6 only. This should obviously include a tidy uh, proof that your operating system is really unable to use IPv4 at all. Just flushing IPv4 addresses and keeping the IPv4 stack loaded does not count. That's important because that has been done before. So ah, no IPv4 sadly, traffic. Somebody already did FreeBSD because it's super easy. Because mm. <laughs> <laughs> Bjorn runs a kernel without IPv4 on purpose. Okay, happy. Uh, Bjorn, you got 100 uh, <laughs> Swiss francs again. <laughs> no, uh, uh, Alexander Kopanen submitted it. Oh, that's it. Okay. Then, yeah. Okay, so the list here, how to disable IPv4 in FreeBSD. Uh, the following manual for turning off IPv4 in FreeBSD was submitted by Alexander Koponen uh, on the 10th of, oh, not too long ago, like uh, from the recording of this episode six days ago. Yep. Okay, so it has been edited a little bit to fit in this, fit in this block format. Uh, here's the instructions. So, again, build an IPv6-only host on FreeBSD without any IPv4 stack. So basically, you install the uh, FreeBSD 12.0 ISO AMD64. Basically, you could also use the other ISOs. I guess the process is the same. So make sure you include the system source package. Uh, when the installer asks you, would you like to configure IPv4? You ask of uh, you answer, of course, no. When the installer asks, would you like to configure IPv6? You say yes, because otherwise there's not much going on in your network. Um, after the system has been installed, you can log into that machine and your if config output looks like uh, what we have here in the blog post. So only INET6 uh, details and no IPv4 addresses at all. So you do a little ping to your little home, uh, 127.0.0.1, and yeah, traffic, local host. Yeah. So obviously not working yet. No route, yep. But when they try to go to 8.8.8.8, they get no route to host because they don't have a v4 address or route but like it says that doesn't uh just because we have no ipv4 connectivity doesn't mean we don't have the ipv4 network stack yeah and the cable is plugged in mind you so <laughs> it's right, not that working you... v6 mm. so okay so no ipv4 stack let's do that and you log in as root you go to your user source sys amd64 conf directory which is your kernel configuration and make a file called generic-ipv6 only. Uh, you edit that file and include a couple of lines that disable uh, basically yeah, so any you, support. The first part is you include the generic config file. So that'll give you the whole normal FreeBSD kernel. You change the ident to be what the name you want it to be. And you set no options inet, and that'll disable the option inet that was included in the generic config you included. So that will provide no IPv4 stack, right? It's INET for v4 and INET6 for v6. Uh, you have to also specify an extra option without INET support um, in when compiling the modules, and that will compile all the modules without uh, v4 support as well. And they disabled the device GRE since that only works over v4, I think. Or maybe I uh, this one probably doesn't compile without v4, so mm -hmm. they disable it. Dependency. Yeah, uh, so then they uh, compile the kernel. Uh, somebody should tell them about dash J so they can use more than one core to do it and it won't take quite as long. Uh, but they install it and reboot. And now even LO0 doesn't have a V4 address. Huh. And when you try to ping uh, with V4, it actually says this address family, I inet, is not supported. Yeah, because it only speaks inet6 from here on. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting. And I guess in the future, 
someday soon, we'll all have that. And no, there was never any IPv5, if anyone is asking. So that's that's been covered. Well, it was an idea somebody had, but it never happened yet. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you want to explain how to do it on some other BSD, although I think the process is almost identical, um, then you could get a 100 uh, Swiss franc uh, coupon for ipv6onlyhosting.com. Okay. If that's not an uh, incentive, I don't know what is. Mm -hmm. Next up, we have a uh, oh a release. GhostBSD 18.12 uh, or 12 has been released. This is the December version. Mm -hmm. Here's the uh, announcement. Ah, yeah. Uh, it's an updated ISO of the GhostBSD 18.10, which we covered, I think, a couple of episodes ago, uh, with some little changes to the live DVD USB and with updated packages. Always good to have. Yeah, so they... Uh made it not load the AMD and Intel kernel modules by default, since that was causing people some problems. Uh, they replaced their Octo package, uh, package manager front end with software-station. Uh, they added back using the GNOP hack, uh, or no, sorry, the GOP hacks in the live system so that it'll use the right resolution, uh, and added a GhostBSD-drivers and GhostBSD-utils uh, utilities, and updated the packages to the latest build. So it's fresh ISOs for people. Oh, yes. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it about uh, GhostBSD. Check it out. If you have something about it uh, and um, have a usage report, maybe, then send it to us at feedback at bsdnow.tv, and then we have something to uh, tell the world about it. Next up is a little bit uh, on the funny side here. Uh, we have found a, and now for a laugh, in hashtag Unix in pictures. Yeah, so uh, the first one here is a guy spraying himself in the face with a fire hose, <laughs> so a big torrent of water there, and uh, that one's varlog syslog. Yeah, too, much me too many messages. <laughs> I guess it'd be on, on BSC, that'd be more like varlog messages, but whatever. Um, for dev null, uh, they have somebody feeding paper into a paper shredder. Uh, next one is uh, find in the current directory all files that end in .h uh, it's a needle in a haystack <laughs> uh, then they have for pwd which is a print working directory tells you where you are right now in the, the directory hierarchy obviously you have the uh, subway map of London <laughs> <laughs> yeah the tube map um, this one, I feel they got the wrong command, actually. So they have du-sh, uh, which is going to tell you how much disk space you're using in the current directory. Uh, and they have an, a fuel gauge down on empty. I think df uh, might have made more sense there for oh, how right. much free space you have, and it would run down like fuel, whereas du would go up as you use more and more stuff. So I think that one they actually got wrong. Oh, okay. Uh, then they have an inline Perl script here to uh, replace all carriage returns with uh, line feeds. Um, but if you do that to a Windows file, you're going to have two line feeds uh, for every new line, which is I, probably not what you want. And so they have <laughs> a, uh, a garbage dumpster on fire. <laughs> <laughs> Very aptly, yeah. Panked. And, oh, pseudo bash is also interesting. And there's, of yeah. course, a Superman picture. Well, it's mostly Clark Kent ripping his shirt open and becoming <laughs> Superman. So it's not yeah. just Superman, it's becoming Superman. Yeah. Okay. Next thing yeah. is the Netcat. Uh, of course, there's a, a big picture Craftsman 540 piece mechanics tool set. Yes. All kinds uh, of... So yeah. This is, the, I think, the Sears tool set <laughs> of, for mechanics. Is, uh, you know, Netcat is 540 tools in one. The Swiss Army knife, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And for, for Emacs, is literally a picture of a tangled bunch of Christmas lights. <laughs> I'm guessing European yeah. by the plug-in there? Uh, yeah, could be. Uh, another funny one. I have uh, more home slash porridge.txt. And it's uh, Oliver Twist. You know, could I have some more? <laughs> <laughs> um. 
editing the password file and they have a picture of Yoda for some reason. That's also not how you should edit the password file. No, don't do that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, PW. Uh, and then running the debugger against uh, uh, on Linux, I guess, is proc kcore on BSD. It'd be dev kmem or dev mem. Uh, mm -hmm. They have Yoda using a lightsaber. <laughs> mm -hmm. Then when they uh, running a they're using S trace, but using truss or D trace or something against the process. And they have the uh, board game operation uh, <laughs> where there's a silhouette of a, a person's body and they have a bunch of um, different parts of the body and use tweezers to try to extract the piece without touching the sides and setting off a buzzer. Mm -hmm. And then they have installing the package libboost uh, is a, uh, a barge <laughs> full of container ships. So it's Which is, a, a ship full of ships. That's large, <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, libboost is big and then includes lots of dependencies that are also big. Mm. And yeah, then yeah. apparently for someone specific, they uh, are looking at the model of their CPU and uh, looking for the string arm and then it's bricks of gold. Oh, ooh, I under okay. And then they have another one where they're setting uh, file attributes uh, in the human genome, and it's putting their hair on fire. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then they have one with a netmap command for scanning a host and uh, somebody picking the lock on a door. Mm. And then lastly, they have uh, a very concisely written shell fork bomb, uh, and it's a picture of a, a nuclear detonation. Explosion, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, very creative. So I guess that's been uh, been added on, on Twitter. And I think if you mention at threader underscore app on a Twitter thread with the keyword compile, uh, you get the link to that one. And you can also, I guess, post other pictures. So the hashtag there is Unix in pictures. Time for Beastie Bits this week. We collected a couple of them, and here they are. Uh, first one we found, or at least the one we put first, we are now closer to the Y2038 bug than the Y2K bug. Mm, yeah. uh, so it's for those that don't know, the Y2038 bug is that uh, in Unix, uh, the kernel and so on keep track of time as a 32-bit signed integer the maximum value of um, derived from how many seconds it's been since uh, January 1st, 1970. Uh, the Unix Big Bang. Yeah. Um, so um, because it's a 32-bit signed integer, it means it'll overflow at about 2 point something million, or billion, sorry. Um, and when it rolls over, it will actually go to being a large negative value. Uh, so the computers will roll back to like, was it like 1904 or something it works out to? I forget. Stone Age, yeah. Yeah. Um, not as big a deal uh, for 64-bit hardware, where we use a 64-bit number to keep track of that now. But for things like i386 uh, and, and the 32-bit ARM, uh, it's kind of a big deal. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the idea is that hopefully we can fix most of the software in time. The problem is a lot of this software is on a very long design cycle between them. You know, if somebody's going to build a device, like say a pipeline controller, they're going to base it on a stable version of FreeBSD, like say FreeBSD 11, uh, which is actually a couple of years old now. Um, and so even if we were to fix the i36 bits um, in uh, FreeBSD 13 today, um, they wouldn't start being incorporated into a product until when that comes out, which would be like 2021, more likely 2022. And then, you know, it takes a couple of years uh, for the version of the operating of the plants they're building with that operating system to actually be finished before they ship it. Mm. Meaning, you know, if it's fixed today, maybe it will ship in hardware uh, that shipped in like, you know, 2030. <laughs> it's getting closer and closer. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so uh, Theodore Rat gave a great talk about this back in 2013, actually, 
at uh, in Malta. Yeah, EuroBSDCon, yeah. Yep. Um, but anyway, the, the point here is that we've now passed the halfway point, which was January 9th, uh, 2019, um, between the year 2000 and the year 2038. Mm-hmm. So, so, yeah. We need to uh, stop waiting. It's like, this problem will keep for a while. It's like, actually, maybe not. Yeah, who knows in which embedded system the last uh, <laughs> overflow will, look, will occur. Yeah, so you're aware now and uh, can look at it. You've been warned. <laughs> we, don't ask us if we didn't. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so next thing here is OpenBSD Enterprise Use. Sounds good. There's a Reddit thread here uh, asking basically uh, if anyone is using OpenBSD in uh, an enterprise setting, whether it's a web mail database or application server, company environments. And uh, um, so one of the first replies here is from someone that used to be the CTO at a publicly traded credit card processing company. Uh, and he says once they took over there, they mandated OpenBSD uh, for as many things as possible. Uh, but I mean, love they had dozens of servers running BSDs, including firewall, VPN, DNS, email, proxy servers, web servers, etc. cetera. Uh, they were running BSD on i386, Alpha, and Spark stations for different jobs. Uh, and they tell you the... Only thing they didn't run BSD were the SQL servers and some Linux web servers that had too much legacy code. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, there's a couple of replies. Yeah, lots of other replies. Okay, so you see it's not totally out of the question and Mm -hmm. perfectly fine. Uh, The other thing we have is AT&T Unix books. This is also on Reddit. We use the old Reddit here because it loads faster, uh, among other things. <laughs> so here's the picture. Oh, here. Wow. That's old. Release. Oh, Unix System 5 Release 4. And they say, note in the background, you can see all the other ones. <laughs> yeah, the, the big stack. <laughs> yeah, so in just uh, the case you encounter such an old system or just have a bit of nostalgia going on, you can read the old manuals. If you look inside, it's, yes, literally like printed man pages. Mm. <laughs> so you can track the differences. What? How is it the man page looking now, if it's still around, and uh, how it was like uh, in the days of the old. Um, oh, this also interesting because uh, process title and missing memory space uh, from our... our Good friend here, uh, Mariusz Saborski. He's blogging and blogging. Can't stop, and we can't co- stop covering his blog posts. Yes, uh, so he was working on uh, adding a capsicum helper for setting the na- the title of a process and was finding that uh, he couldn't figure out where some of the memory for this was coming from or where it was going afterwards. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he broke out the debugger and actually walks through and kind of teaches you how to See how all this works. Okay. Yeah, with code examples and uh, GDB uh, invocations. Oh, yeah. This is good. Mm-hmm. People want to know more about debugging under Unix. Yep. It's a good intro to something relatively basic and using a bunch of the interesting tools uh, on FreeBSD as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, we also have the history of a security hole over at the os2museum.com. Yes, warning, if you don't care about the finer points of the x86 architecture, uh, please stop reading right now in the interest of your own sanity. <laughs> uh, but this says, uh, a while ago I was made aware of a strange problem causing a normal user process running on 32-bit i386 on BSD 6.3 to be able to crash the OS. Only on i386, not on AMD 64. The problem turned out to be a security hole with history that goes back more than 30 years. We had this already in the show, old bugs, but... Yeah. Yeah. And so the crashing code uh, looked like it didn't really have any business crashing, but the CPU was in a very odd state with inaccessible kernel stack and the GDT that's extremely unhealthy because uh, exceptions and interrupts can triple fault and cause the CPU to shut down. Mm-hmm. And they, Oops. they talk about how when the 
286 was released in 1982. Uh, it introduced support for hardware task switching, and apparently that's where the problem lies. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it has the whole history there. So if you're interested, go check it out. Okay. Uh, another thing we have for the ad-infested uh, people, uh, we have a little bit of a relief for you with the Unbound Ad Block, the ultimate network ad blocker. It's a tutorial f- uh, with uh, uh, using PF and the block list. I guess that's... So uh, that's... using Unbound Ad Block will basically block the ads at your DNS server. Yes, right at the beginning. So they don't uh, get to your browser or any other network. Uh, yeah, and it equipment. allows you to set it up once instead of having to install browser-based ad blockers on every one of your devices. <clears throat> oh, okay. And the pfcon for that is uh, fairly simple. Mm-hmm. And oh, yeah, that should be easy to implement on a on a weekend <laughs> or an evening, <laughs> whichever comes first. Uh, yeah, cool. That's nice, still good. Yeah. Uh, so they set it up so that um, the Ad block user will be able to um, update the config for the firewall and uh, yeah, set it all up. Mm, cool. Oh, for the people who are still interested in how uh, FreeBSD's name value pairs library work or what uh, it entails, there's a little, well, let's say reference over at GitHub uh, from the wheel systems folks. I well, see, this is uh, uh, making the libnv package available externally. So this ah, way, um, okay. you can use it on other operating systems if you want, or embed it into your own application. Okay, great. Yeah, that's Marius Saborski and uh, Pavel yeah, Davidek. So, uh, Pavel Davidek wrote it originally under sponsorship of the FreeBSD Foundation, and then uh, for the last couple of years, uh, Marius Saborski has been basically the maintainer of it. Uh, so it has uh, some extra documentation. So I've helped Marius with the man pages for this a bunch. Uh, so the man pages are quite good, but their function references and so on, this like, is more of an introduction to how to actually use it. Uh, it actually points to a bunch of blog posts that he's written over time. Um, so with this, you'll actually be able to install libnv easily on uh, Red Hat or Debian-based distros. So it shows how to make an RPM or a deb package uh, so that you can use NVList um, on your your own project, your own software. Okay. Very nice. Yeah. So mm-hmm. spread the word. Uh, oh, there's something about a PID rollover. Yes. Uh, so this is an interesting uh, one, again, from uh, Chris Seibenman over at the University of Toronto, who we often uh, read his blog posts about um ZFS, but he has an interesting one. This one I think is actually from Linux, but um, talks about the PID numbers. So on Unix, everything is a process, uh, even threads, um, and all processes have a PID or a process ID. In theory, the only special PID is PID1 for init, uh, which has a bunch of special cases around it. Um, uh, So Unixes also have a special PID0 for the kernel or whatever, but... um, and generally, PIDs are assigned by just incrementing the last PID by one and so on. Uh, although with FreeBSD or uh, OpenBSD, you can also randomize the PIDs so that they're not sequential like that. Um, anyway, once again, a very long time ago, Unix was a small thing and ran on small, slow machines uh, and only had a 16-bit integer. So the PDP-11 actually only had PIDs that went up to... Uh, the maximum value it could use for the PID was 32,767. And so in the code, they just did, if the PID is over 30,000, set it back to zero and then go back to searching for uh, a PID that's not in use. Mm-hmm. And this is, as a side note, the Unix v7 kernel has a lot of go-tos in it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so that's PID rollover. When you get past the very last PID, like uh, on FreeBSD by on most PSDs by default is nine 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 nine, then it loops back to the beginning, and then it keeps incrementing until it finds one that's not in use. Mm-hmm. Um, 
So that's PID rollover. The, the magic MPID is the kernel global variable that holds the last PID that was used. When it hits the maximum, it rolls back to zero and gets incremented by one, and we go on from there until we find one that's not in use. Um, <clears throat> the other interesting thing was back then, Unix actually had a hard-coded variable called nproc, or for number of processes, which was capped at 150. So most of those 30,000 PID numbers are not going to be in use if you're not allowed to have more than 150 running processes. Um, but that's not really the case anymore. Anyway, ever since v7, most Unix systems have kept the concept uh, of a PID rollover, having some maximum value and then rolling over once it's up. Uh, he says, Chris says, uh, I believe that it's common for modern Unixes to reset PIDs to something above one uh, so that the very low numbered PIDs uh, don't get reused even if there are no processes there anymore. Uh, on Linux, this low point is hard coded value of 300. <clears throat> uh, so you can tell PIDs that started at the beginning versus everything else. But anyway, uh, since Unix, uh, or Unix is no longer running on hardware, where you really want to use 16-bit integers to keep track of things, uh, yeah. we could have a much larger maximum PID value if we wanted to. In fact, uh, all current Unixes use a C type for PIDs uh, that's at least 32 bits, and perhaps even 64 bits, uh, but in the kernel and in user space. Um, sticking to signed 32-bit integers, uh, you'd still have over 2 billion possible PIDs. Uh, and it would take more than 12 years of using a new PID every... Uh, 500 microseconds before you'd run into a PID rollover. However, Unixes are startlingly conservative and no one wants to go this high by default, uh, although people are tinkering with other specific numbers. Um, mm. The kill command gets a lot more interesting when your PID number is this long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so right now, FreeBSD's PID is limited to uh, one less than 100,000, uh, whereas I think Dragonfly and Linux go up to a million, I think. I forget. Could very well be, yeah. To be fair, the only reason to keep PIDs small is that it makes the output of commands like PS and TOP shorter and more readable and makes it easier to tell different PIDs apart. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's the problem with something like a GUID is if every PID starts and ends with the same couple of digits, but the middle is the part you have to look for. It's a lot harder for a human brain to notice the differences. Yeah, or like in top where you have to display this very long number, the, yes. the columns need to align properly. Yes, um, but at the same time, uh, it might be easier to figure stuff out if you know that a PID has never been reused. You yeah. know, currently, if you read an error log and see, you know, PID this number exited, and then you look at that PID number now, it's probably something else or nothing. But anyway. Yeah. Um, very few systems uh, can have enough active or zombie processes that they'll actually need more than 30,000 PIDs at once. And for the rest of us, having a low maximum PID makes life more friendly. Of course, we don't want to have a PID rollover to have, uh, if we have too low of a maximum PID, um, we can just have PID randomization. But in theory, PID rollover is just as good, and that's where Unix has always done for certain values of Unix and certain values of always. <laughs> <laughs> you know, since OpenBSD has had random as the default for a long time. Yeah. In the grand Unix tradition, uh, people say that PID rollover doesn't have issues. Uh, it just exposes issues in other code that aren't that isn't fully correct. Um, such code includes anything that uses uh, the daemon commands PID files, code that assumes that PID numbers will always be ascending. Uh, or that if process B is a descendant of process A, it will have a PID that's higher than process A. Uh, and code that is vulnerable if you can successfully predict the PID of a to-be-created process and then grab that resource uh, with that number. That's why OpenBSD has the randomization to block those attacks, but more importantly, point out those errors and those assumptions so they can be fixed uh, before they turn into a problem. Yeah. Preemptive. Okay, so uh, oh, speaking about OpenBSD, uh, we have a an article about booting OpenBSD kernels in EFI mode with QEMU. Yep. Uh, so this is using the OVMF fr uh, firmware, which is an open source EFI implementation, basically, uh, which is a BSD licensed UEFI firmware implementation that you can use in virtual machines. 
And basically they show how they create an EFI system partition, uh, put the OpenBSD loader into it, uh, and then boot up a QMU and start uh, OpenBSD with UEFI. Oh, okay. Very nice. So it's straightforward. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're not done yet with OpenBSD info. We have something about, oh, that's a cool one. OpenBSD CVS commit, make MinCore lie. Ooh. So uh, this is on uh, OpenBSD-CVS from 10 Unangst. And the log message goes, make MinCore lie. The nature of shared memory means it can spy on what another process is doing. We don't want that. So instead, have it always returned that memory is in core. Right. So this isn't actually min core. This is M as in memory in core. Um, so the M in core system call determines whether each of the pages in the region belonging between you know, the address and the length um, is actually in RAM rather than maybe possibly being swapped out or whatever. Uh, the status is returned in the vector array, uh, one character per page, so on and so on. Uh, and so they make it lie and say that the memory is always there um, when it might not actually be because we don't want to uh, leak information. Mm. Okay, yeah, always good to have. And uh, calling all the BSD folks out there, BSD Can 2019 call for papers is ending January 19 soon or always, mm -hmm. yeah, on the around this time. So why are you still not having submitted something? Yes. Uh, submit right away. Um, the proposal system they use, Pentabarf, um, allows you to edit your proposal after you submit it. So get it submitted, and then you can polish it after if you have to. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, uh, but you, you want to no... get definitely want to get it in there before the deadline. Yes. Again, uh, yeah, January 19th and then they will hardly uh, cut it off, and then they will let the uh, paper committee decide who's going to be giving a talk or a workshop at BSDCAN 2019. Uh, the dates again, uh, so BSDCAN 2019 is happening in May, important, in the May. So tutorials will be 15th and 16th of May, and the conference actual will be the 17th and 18th of May. Yeah. And we hope to see you there. So Don't anyway, hide. get your submission in uh, by January 19th, and you will be informed by February 19th uh, if your proposal has been accepted, and then they will start you know, arranging the flights and hotels and everything for the speakers. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an FAQ and some examples and stuff on the website there on what um, your submission, submission should look like and what it talks about and so on. Uh, also, Michael W. Lucas on his blog has some... Uh, notes from his years on the program committee uh, kind of giving you more advice if you're not sure exactly what to write or how, you know, what parts to explain and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Keep give it, uh, give it enough detail so that people can make a good judgment about it. If you just say I want to give a talk about X, that's not enough to make right. a picture. Uh -huh. The general idea is you want to um, explain what the talk's about, who will find it useful, what the key takeaways are, you know, why would people pay to come and see this, basically? Mm. And, and it's not just, it? yeah, and it's not just a kernel and obscure uh, usage. It's also sysadmin and other parts that where BSD is used and where people might find a talk or a workshop about that interesting. So yep. that's, that's it. Another conference Alan is probably going to is the OpenZFS user conference in April. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Datto, one of the companies that uses ZFS on Linux, is hosting the ZFS user conference for the third or fourth year now. Uh, I went last year. It was a good time. And so we're hoping to have a, a stronger FreeBSD showing at the user conference this year. So that'll be April 18th and 19th at Datto's headquarters in Norwalk, Connecticut, which is very close to New York. Um, and yeah, it'll be uh, some presentations from mostly users. Uh, it's This is not just another developer summit. This is very specifically a conference for ZFS users. Uh, so people who use ZFS will be talking about the interesting ways they use it and is a great time to talk about problems or 
um, things you would like to see in ZFS that aren't there now, uh, or just use cases you have and so on, uh, to get in the room with other power users and developers. Yes, it's a good chance to get your feature proposed, or at least the devs are listening. So what a good chance to uh, get your ZFS story out there. Yeah, uh, if you go to zfs.dato.com, D-A-T-T-O, um, they have the list of talks from previous years. So uh, like in 2017, they had uh, talks covering uh, how to build a large-scale home lab for backups, uh, how to do file system uh, comparison between ZFS and other file systems, um, how Lawrence Livermore National Labs sysadmin does monitoring and management of their giant ZFS arrays, um, you know, performance analysis and tuning, um, how pool allocation classes were going to work. Um, another user had a tale of a pathological storage workload that a specific workload that just made their uh, made ZFS unhappy, and they talked about a bit of, a bit about it. And with feedback they got there, they could change their workload a little bit and ZFS a little bit, and now it's not pathological anymore. It works. Ah, see, that's how you get your uh, problem into the <laughs> into and the then, spotlight. Uh, in 2018, when I managed to attend, they had. Um, Matt Ahrens did flexible disk use, uh, which was VDEV removal and RAID-Z expansion. Um, uh, Calvin Hendricks-Parker talked about uh, how they use ZFS for backups. Uh, OS Nexus talked about how their appliance works. Uh, Micron talked about their new uh, SSDs and how those will be useful to ZFS. Uh, Alex Pinchuk talked about uh, Zpool layout considerations and how that works. Uh, Tony Hunter from uh, Lawrence Livermore talked about how they actually do the releases and how they do the version numbering and so on for ZFS on Linux. Uh, Tom Caputi did a great talk on helping developers help you. And it was um, some of the things you can do when you're reporting a bug to make it easier for the developer to reproduce it and so on. Uh, and then on the second day, there was uh, a talk from uh, an analyst at Percona about using ZFS and MySQL together uh, and, you know, where that's good and where it's maybe not as fast as using something other than ZFS. In the end, ZFS does have to do more work, but, um, you know, it has a number of advantages that can make it faster. Uh, then I did my talk about uh, Z standard compression and then... Um, Actually, Eric Spool, uh, the person that presented about their pathological use case the year before, uh, gave a little thank you ZFS talk afterwards uh, since they managed to solve that problem and it's working better than another file system would for them. Yeah. Okay. There's a wide variety of, of usage. And we'd like to see even more users and uh, more user-focused topics. So please do... Uh, attend the conference, and if you can, uh, submit a talk. Mm -hmm. And the last bit that we have is, since the beginning of 2019, the FreeBSD Journal is a free publication now. So no more money to pay. You will get a uh, every two months. Yeah, there's a new uh, journal edition going out, and each one has a, uh, a heading or a, a specific topic about it. And a um, yeah, a theme for the whole thing. And, um, the, yeah, we've been working on this for a while to get it uh, done properly. So they also uh, have something on the FreeBSD Foundation's uh, website about um, the transition. There's a little uh, FAQ in the journal section uh, because people have been asking, so, you know, why are you moving uh, to a free subscription model and why have you removed it from the mobile app stores? And um, so the important part is um, if you're already a subscriber and uh, now that the journal is free, um, you have to re-register when your current subscription runs out. Otherwise, you don't get the, the newer editions. Right. And basically, your subscription, your old one will still expire and you just make a new one that won't expire uh, yeah. and it'll be free. But the important thing is uh, the high quality content of the FreeBSD journal will now be available to everyone for free. Yes, and we're constantly looking also for articles or for authors mm -hmm. who want to, for example, review books or have something interesting to uh, tell the world. And it's even better now that since everyone 
doesn't have to pay for it, there's probably more eyes uh, looking through the journal. Yep, uh, and uh, kind of planned out uh, themes for 2019 include getting started with FreeBSD, uh, which will be coming up soon, uh, as it's a January-February issue, um, debugging and testing in March and April, uh, FreeBSD for makers, so if you're doing something interesting with uh, a BeagleBone or Pine64 or whatever, um, do hurry up and write that up. Um, <laughs> July and August will be about containerization, uh, so that's a big one. And then September and October will be about security, and November and December will be about network virtualization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you are uh, interested in any of those topics, then there's a little email address at the bottom where you can send your proposal to and we'll get in touch with you. Uh, and remember that the uh, not every article has to be on theme. The theme is just to mostly to give them an, an idea to, to get a bunch of articles. Uh, but if you have anything else to write, do send it to them and uh, they will find a place for it. Yeah. And while you're waiting, you can still uh, read the current one, which also has a couple of interesting articles about uh, like the ZPool checkpoint feature or how to yes. debug the kernel. I need to read the debug the kernel one. I know a little bit, but having a bit more background uh, and less just, I saw this on some website somewhere, uh, <laughs> would be helpful. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons why we do the journal. Okay, on to the oh, questions. Yes, uh, feedback and questions are always welcome. And the first this week is Chris with uh, Boot Environments and SSDs. Uh, writes us, uh, Hi, Alan and Benedict. I finally splurged on some shiny new SSDs since they were discounted, uh, enough to justify the cost of two to dis uh, replace the ZFS mirror in my desktop. I'm doing a fresh install of FreeBSD 12 on them, and I have a few questions. First one, does the FreeBSD 12 installer create a single pool uh, for UEFI boot? Yes. Uh, in 11 it did, but if you used encrypted disks, then it couldn't. But in 12, you get a single pool no matter what. Huh. Yeah, he writes that he doesn't have uh, any boot environments yet since he has a separate boot pool, uh, so he feels he's missing out. But yeah, yes, that's the way out. to go. <laughs> okay, the second question is, what are the, current, the correct steps to replace a pool for an upgrade like this? So after he set up the OS on the new disks, he wants to be able to import the old pools to copy data from them. And anything special required to keep them from conflicting with the new pool or for Gally decryption to work? Uh, he's done this before, but it's been a while and he likely makes it more difficult. Uh, or yeah. So you need to do Gally attach on each of the disks uh, for your, your old pool. Then when you do the zpool import, if you do dash capital R, slash mnt or some other directory, it will prefix all of the paths in the pool with that directory, like slash mnt, so that the this, the older pool won't mount its slash usr over top of your slash usr, uh, and so on. So it'll mount it all in a subdirectory, and then you'll be able to just do the sends and receives and so on. If you're going to just use send receive or whatever, you can also import uh, with, in addition to the dash capital R, dash capital N, and it won't try to mount any of it, and then you'll easily be able to just send and receive it. Okay. And the last question, finally, are there any special settings or considerations to be aware of for ZFS on SSDs? There's one. Um, so there's a sysctl, vfs.zfs.vdev. Uh, anyway, it's called trim underscore on underscore init. Mm -hmm. Ah, I know where this is going. Yeah. So, um, yes, vfs.zfs.vdev.trim on init. Um, so what that does is when you do zpool create, it's going to trim the whole part of the SSD that you used when creating the pool, whatever partition you gave to ZFS. Um, that'll make the zpool create take a while, sometimes like many minutes. Uh, mm -hmm. or even an hour, uh, depending how big the SSD is and how fast it is and how good a trim it is and so on. Um, if these are brand new SSDs and they're not actually going to have anything on them, they probably don't need to be trimmed. If you just mm -hmm. set that sysctl to zero uh, before you create the pool, uh, the pool will create faster and save you a bunch of minutes, but not a big deal. Yeah, but this one is not set to in the installer. 
when you set up the system. Right, the installer assumes that your disk might have old stuff on it, so it trims it. Um, mm -hmm. All it does is make it take a bit longer, so it's it's not a problem. Um, if you find that your SSD uh, model in particular isn't good at trim, you might consider turning trim off if it's a problem. But uh, if you watch the ZFS um, leadership meeting we had earlier this month, uh, you see that it turns out that uh, trim will either be required to make your SSD not suck, uh, will do nothing, or will make your SSD suck. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it really depends on the model of the drive and the firmware and a bunch of other things. Uh, so with trim, there's no right answer. It very much depends on the specific hardware you're using, whether you need trim to make the drive useful or if enabling trim will make it worse. Mm. But in general, there's nothing special you need to do and you should be able to just Im uh, Gelly attach to decrypt the drives and then uh, Zpool import dash capital R slash MNT uh, to mount the second pool, but with a prefix on the path, an alt root, so that it will not uh, mount over top of your new system. Mm. Yeah, so in general, enjoy your new SSDs, and I guess you're already familiar enough with ZFS so that this just uh, is another system with SSDs. Excellent. Ooh, and yeah. Question. Uh, yeah, the one, the next one is from Jonathan about uh, the bytes issued during a zpool scrub. Uh, it's short and sweet. Uh, what does the number of bytes issued mean during a zpool scrub? Previously, the scrub just showed how many bytes had been scanned. The number of bytes isn't uh, issued seems to be new with FreeBSD 12, and I can't find anything explaining what it means. And here's an example. Right. So this is the new sequential scrub and resilver feature, uh, which makes scrub and resilver much faster on newer versions of ZFS. Uh, so the way it used to work is it would um, start at the top of the ZFS tree um, and just scan the blocks as it found them. But that means you are seeking all over the drives a lot all the time, which with mechanical drives is very slow. Um, yeah. And so you never got that much speed out of it. With the new sequential scrub, the way it works is it sets aside an amount of memory um, I think it's like one thirty second of your RAM or 600 megabytes is the limit. I forget exactly Not too what much. it is. Mm -hmm. uh, and it starts walking the tree and creating what's called a range tree, which basically a list of start here and run until here, kind of. Um, and it starts constructing this range tree of the blocks it actually needs to scan. Yeah. Uh, so it's reading the metadata and saying, okay, I need to read this block of data and then puts that in the list. And I keep scanning metadata, filling up this uh, range tree. Once the range tree has hit the maximum size, the amount of memory that uh, is set up for it, um, it will then look through that range tree and find the biggest contiguous range of bytes that need to be worked on. Okay, so there's no much, not much seeking this way for right. this so specific part? If, so the first number is scanned. That's as it's walking the metadata, and it's building mm -hmm. up this list. And at some point, it'll hit a point where there's not enough free memory, or there's not enough in that limited amount of memory, to, the range tree is full. So then it yeah. finds the biggest contiguous block of work and issues it to the disk, saying, actually, go do the work. Mm -hmm. So instead of at going through the disk, and every time you find a block, you go and check it, it builds yeah. a to-do list. Mm -hmm. And you defer that. Uh, and then yeah, once the to-do list is full, you take the biggest item off the to-do list, go do it, issue it. It actually does the work on disk then it can go back to scanning. Um, and as it keeps doing this, it's going to keep issuing big contiguous, like scan this big long range. So it's scanning you know, hundreds of megabytes or gigabytes at a time instead of kilobytes at a time. And that will leave a lot less seeking. Um, and so yes, the scan number should keep going up uh, and then the issued number will keep coming up to match it basically. And then mm -hmm. at the very end, both numbers will get to the maximum, which on his is 33.9 terabytes of data. When I did okay. a quick test of this the other day on my machine, doing the sequential scrub, the new one, took four hours to scan, I think, 20.7 terabytes of data. Mm -hmm. Whereas the um, there's a sysctl you can set to switch to the old one, although there's not really a reason to do that because the new one is faster. Um, <laughs> But it's called 
ZFS underscore scan underscore legacy. Uh, oh. And if you set that, it will do it the older, slower way. Um, for on my system, which I've been has very low fragmentation, so it's um, not a particularly hard case. Um, the new way took four hours, and the old way took nine and a half hours, so more than double. Ooh, that's a difference, um, yeah. <laughs> on a highly fragmented pool, I would expect it to be somewhere between two and sixteen times faster. Mm, wow. Uh, and who so came yeah, up basically, with that? the scan number is how much metadata it's co- how much work it's figured out that it needs to do, and issued is how much it's actually done of it yet. Okay. So that's uh, and good. so basically, it's the new faster scrub resilver. Uh, you can set a CCTL to switch back to the old one, but the new one is almost always faster. Yeah. So keep it as it is <laughs> uh, yeah but it's uh it's difficult for, for a short or, while there was a bug in head where it would actually go up to 200 percent complete and be very confusing but that was fixed <laughs> okay yeah it's good to know that um this makes sense to make it uh, faster and not uh, you know spin yeah. the disc too much exactly well it's not so much it's about uh, having to seek around the disc moving the head back yeah. and forth all the time because yes mm-hmm. if you do sequential reads on a regular hard drive you get somewhere between 100 and almost up to 200 megabytes a second per disk. Um, if you do completely random, you'll get somewhere between like 1 and 10 megabytes per second per disk. Mm. So, yes, sequential yeah. is better. And so this tries to turn it all into sequential, which, um, interesting, can even have improvements for SSDs because uh, reading larger blocks at a time is just more efficient than reading the same amount of data, but as a bunch of small pieces. Mm. All right. I think that uh, explains mm-hmm. it. Yes. Uh, oh, then we have a, a continued uh, story from Boston about a question he asked a couple of episodes ago um, regarding ZFS record sizes and some of the mistakes he did there, apparently. So he writes now, some time ago I wrote in asking about the benefits of the ZFS record size. As I understood it, it's best to use one megabyte large blocks for large files in the data set. Among other things, uh, this should reduce the total size of the data set uh, by roughly 10%. Uh, uh, I, probably not that much. Uh, it can result in quite a bit less metadata and padding. I think I've seen like 6 or 7% sometimes. But yeah, mm-hmm. there's some savings. Yeah. So he used ZFS get and set record size commands to check and set that. And after setting it, uh, checked again the record size, and it changed from 125K to 1M. That's how it should be. 128K. Uh, yeah, 128. And here are the mistakes. Uh, so let's call this data set data set A. I wanted to quickly get the data set size in the pool, so I checked in in, uh, in it the, yeah, the FreeNAS GUI under the storage tab. It says one TIB used, and then he moved, did not copy all data from his data set A to another data set B using File Manager in Linux. And after that, copied all data back to his original data set A and checked that used size of this data set A in FreeNAS, and it said 23 gigabytes, GB bits, um, which was previously one terabyte. Uh, at this point, uh, he also found out that it had snapshots in this data set A, so he ended up with three terabytes of data in this pool. Mm-hmm. So yeah, here's the question. How do you do all of this correctly to get the actual size of the data sets and um, the size of the files it seemed the same space taken on the disks as well as how to properly move and copy files from such data sets in order that new record sizes gets into effect so the biggest thing there is you actually touched on it in the beginning using zfs get um so if you look at a data set and just do zfs get uh you can say all as the property name and it'll just give you all the properties and then look at a data set um in particular to see the gain you've gotten from the larger record size, it'll mostly be the difference between the um, used and the logically used uh, properties, or the referenced and logically referenced. Um, used includes snapshots, references, or reference does not. Um, but if we look at uh, my data set here, the used is 3.94 terabytes, and the logically used is 3.96 terabytes. So I've saved, you know, 0.02 terabytes. Mm-hmm. And the ZFS man page has descriptions for those um, individual yeah. uh, information. 
or this. So yeah. each data set has some yeah. properties, including uh, used and referenced, and then logically used and logically referenced. So logically means the size of the actual files, and then used is the size after compression and the larger record size and all that. Yep, that's how you query the, the data set or the particular information in it. Uh, I guess that's what it is. Yeah. Uh, much. And then he, so yes, why is free space in the pool reduced if I copy the exact same data back to the data set? Um, so each data set is separate, so it doesn't uh, do anything there. You don't have deduplication because you don't want it. But um, ZFS does have a thing called a NOP write, which is when you're writing, when you're overwriting a file, it compares the checksums on the blocks, and if they're the same, it won't actually overwrite the block. Uh, but if you use a different record size, then the blocks aren't going to be the same because one of them is going to be 828K records and the other one's going to be a one, one megabyte record. And so they wouldn't be the same. Mm. Uh, but yes, just moving the data like that is pretty much the only thing you can do because ZFS send is generally going to keep it in, at the record size it already is. Um, I've not looked into what it would take to do um, up blocking so that you could do a ZFS send that would convert large files that were stored as 128k records into files with one megabyte records. Um, ZFS send has the ability to go the other way. If you send from a data set with one megabyte blocks and you don't specify the capital L flag, uh, yep. saying that the receiver supports large blocks, it will break those large blocks down into small ones. Mm. Uh, I've not had enough of a use case to bother trying to write the complicated code to go the other way and yeah. send a data set of small blocks into bigger blocks. Yeah, typically want to have one M that gives you more flexibility regarding the, uh, the size. No, it's just there's some efficiency savings usually. Mm. Uh, although most of the efficiency savings probably come from how it ends up working out for RAID Z padding and not anything else. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, the bigger record sizes will also give you a bit more uh, compression uh, results. Yes, or... you also get better compression. Yeah, at least that's what I noticed when I have a lot of uh, uh, JSON files and, uh, you know, yeah. this is just text. Uh, especially, uh, there was a interesting counterpoint uh, with databases. Generally with database, the common wisdom is use a small record size like 8K or 16K that matches the record size of the database so that um, a database doesn't have to do a read, modify, update. It does a read, modify, write. It'll just overwrite in place. Uh, well, not in place because it's ZFS, but anyway. Um, but if you use a larger record size, you get more compression and you might fit more data in fewer blocks and get more caching and it might actually work out better. But it depends on your database and your workload and so on. Mm. Okay, that should be it for this episode. Again, if you have anything for us, you can send us also a tweet at BSD now. That's our handle there. Or send it uh, as a traditional uh, email to feedback at bsdnow.tv. Anything that you have, questions, comments, show ideas, and then we'll have future episodes with your content. Yeah. Uh, thank you. See you next week. <laughs>